So now we need to take a fairly significant jump forward in history, jumping from about the 1600s all the way to the mid to late 1800s. And we're jumping all the way from England to Norway and then to Russia, because what we need to discuss now is the evolution of the realism movement. Now, when we look back at all the history that we have covered in these videos, and we have covered a lot, we have covered so, so much. We've seen a lot of changes. We've seen a changing in the subject matter that theater would deal with. We've seen an evolution of playwriting as an art form. We've seen theater go from being one of the strongest cultural influencers to being almost extinct and then back again multiple times. But throughout all of that, something has remained fairly in place and fairly the same throughout all of history, and that is the plays themselves have never attempted to capture real life. Now, you may recall the neoclassics said that their plays were trying to be more true to life, but they weren't trying to actually capture real life. People going to a play or people reading a play were never under any delusions that what they were seeing was anything but a story being told to them. You go, let's go back to the Elizabethans for a second and that historical tidbit about during the Elizabethan era, all of the female roles were played by men. One of the questions I get asked most is, so the people back then didn't care that they were going to see uh, two guys do a love scene, that they're going to see a guy pretending to be a girl? And the answer is simply no, because the mindset of those theater goers was that they knew what they were going to see was fake. They knew that it was just a story. This is why things like ghosts and witches and really big characters having really big emotions were so accepted for so long, because that's just the way plays were, and audiences never expected anything else. Now we move to the 1800s and we move to Norway and then we're going to move to Russia. And what we see starting to evolve here in the style of plays that are being written is now playwrights are starting to say, you know what, I'm getting very tired of plays about big characters. I'm getting tired of actors up on stage and when they act, they're acting with big voices and big emotions. I want to see something that reflects the true drama of day-to-day -day life. I want to see something that tries to tell me a story about the world I'm living in and the people I know and the things I am experiencing. And so drama takes a very hard turn and suddenly Plays are now starting to be written that are trying to recapture real life. And this is where the realism movement comes in. Realism, simply put, is trying its best to recreate life on stage. It wants people to come in and feel like they are watching a real situation unfold. They want people to come in and see the stories that they are living, the drama that is in everyday life being recreated for them in a style that is closer to reality than anything that had ever come before. This movement is going to affect how art, not just theater, but art is viewed going forward. This is the style of theater that has become the predominant style. Realism is the order of the day. In movies, in television shows, theater, anything that is a performance art, realism and the idea of we want to actually feel for these characters. We want to feel like we know these characters. We want to believe that these people are, in fact, real and not just larger-than-life personas. All of this is traced back 
to the beginning of the realism movement. The realism movement sought to convince their audiences that the stage action truly represented everyday life. So unlike dramas from the Elizabethan era, or even the Greeks, or the Middle Ages, or the Romans, or any other time that we have discussed, the drama of the realism movement did not feature larger-than-life characters. It was not written in verse. It had no supernatural figures. This was realistic drama that was doing its best to mirror everyday life. So the action on stage resembled what people could observe around them. The way characters behaved, the way they spoke, the way they dressed, all of it was done like ordinary people. The man that we credit as being the founder of modern day realism is this man, Henrik Ibsen. Ibsen was a Norwegian playwright who, for the vast majority of his life, considered himself to be an outcast from the very society that he would become famous for dramatizing. He always felt that he lived his life differently than the norm, that he saw the world in a different way than the norm. And we believe that it is because of this feeling that so many of his most famous works come from the point of view of those folks that would be at odds with society, those that society has overlooked or just outright forgotten about. His earliest plays were based on Norwegian history and mythology, and they're mainly romantic verse dramas that examine the extremes in the Norwegian national character. However, it's what we would call his middle dramas that he would become the most famous for. These are the plays that he wrote that would take on the form of realistic social dramas. These plays explore the interaction of people with society, dealing with problems that had never, up until that point, ever truly been written about, or at the very least, had not been written about in an honest and realistic manner. Things like the problems of an unhappy marriage, the sexual double standard, why are things okay for men to do, but not okay for women to do? the concept of infidelity, and the position of women in society. His best-known works are works that feature female protagonists. All of his plays share a common theme of the individual amidst conflicting social pressures. So people caught between what society says they should do and what the character knows they need to do, and we can see this in his two most famous works. First up, A Doll's House. This is probably the work for which he is best known. This play centers around a turn-of-the-century woman by the name of Nora, who is married to a man named Torvald, and at the end of the play, Nora leaves Torvald. She goes and gets a divorce. The play ends with her slamming the door shut, and many critics have called this the slam heard round the world. Henrik Ibsen's other most famous work is a play by the name of Hedda Gabler, wherein the title character of Hedda is a woman who is married to one man and yet feverishly in love with another, and when she cannot have the man that she is in love with, she sets out on a quest to destroy him. This play deals with a lot of similar themes that we find in Henrik Ibsen's other work. The wild nature versus tamed assimilation. The individual versus the group. 